Greetings everyone, I'm Perry Stone and I have something very special to share with you today. We're going to be going to the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. These are two great prophets of the Bible and I'm going to be sharing with you what they taught concerning the very last days and the very end of time. I believe that we are in the time that the prophets spoke about. Uh, the terms end time, end days, latter days, last days are synonymous to those days at the very end of the age. And as Christians, we believe that Jesus Christ will return at some point when certain signs of the times are fulfilled. And that's what we're going to talk about. But we're going to talk about it from a little bit different perspective. We're going to show you that Daniel and John, of course Daniel who wrote the book of Daniel, John who wrote the book of Revelation, the last book of the New Testament, speak about a final world empire. And they also speak about a man who will come to power ruling that final world empire. And a man who will come along with this particular man who will rule, who will be a religious leader. He will bring the world under one one type of religion. So we're going to talk about that today and I believe that you're going to find it very interesting. Our main scripture that we're going to use is found in Revelation chapter 17 verses 7 through 13 and we will be explaining this a little later on uh, in the program. I want to read to you as you follow with me. And the angel said to me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee of the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. And here is mine that hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and he is of the seventh, and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. And these have one mind, and shall give that their power and strength unto the beast." Now before we go into this in detail, let's go to the book of Daniel and show you what Daniel saw in his prophetic writings concerning empires that would rule the world. One of the greatest visions in the entirety of the Bible is found in Daniel chapter 2. Now 2,600 years ago, King Nebuchadnezzar was king of Babylon. Babylon, as many of you know, is now located in the country of Iraq, not far from Baghdad. This was a great world empire. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream one night of a great image. It was an image that looked like a man. And he couldn't remember the dream, so he asked his wise men to interpret it. None of them could. But finally, Daniel, in whom was the Spirit of God, came and interpreted the king's dream. This is found in Daniel chapter 2. This great image had a head of gold. It had arms and chest of silver. It had hips of brass, legs of iron, and the feet were very strange because the feet and the toes were part iron and part clay. Daniel then interpreted for Nebuchadnezzar the meaning of the dream. He said, Nebuchadnezzar, the head of gold represents you and the Babylonian empire. Now that was the empire ruling in Daniel's time. He said, but after you will come another empire that will be inferior to you, and it is the chest of silver, and it's the Medes and the Persians. The image had, of course, two arms. One part represented the Media Empire. One represented the Persian Empire. Then he said, after this empire will come the Grecian Empire. And that was represented on the image as the hips of brass. And then he said, after Greece will come an empire that's very strange. It's hard to describe, but there will be a major, mighty empire after that. Now we know historically what empire that was. That was the Roman Empire that ruled for hundreds of years after the Grecian Empire fell and collapsed. Rome took over. And then he said, at the very bottom of your image, king, you saw feet and toes. And of course, as all people do, they have five toes on each foot, making a total of ten toes. And that's what the king saw. He said, there will come at the end of time the feet and the toes. There will come a last empire, and there will be ten kings that will come out of that empire, and that will be the final empire of the world. And then Daniel 
described in the dream, the stone coming out off of a mountain, crushing those kingdoms, and that's when Daniel predicted that's the day, that's the time at the very end of days when God will set up a kingdom that shall never end. Now, all of this is found in Daniel chapter 2, and the interpretation to that dream is found in Daniel 2. Now, remember this. Daniel interpreted these things before any of this was happening, before the Medes and Persians came, before Alexander the Great and the Grecian Empire came, before the Roman Empire came. Daniel is interpreting the dream in advance, hundreds of years in advance, by the Spirit of the living God. Now, if we go on and read, we will discover that God used uh, different types of metals to represent those different empires. For example, the head of gold represented Babylon. Is there a reason for that? Yes. Babylon, in its day, under King Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar, had all the gold from the Jewish temple, plus all this other gold they had collected through the spoils of war. And so they were a kingdom with gold. I mean, they were buildings that were inlaid with gold and so forth. So Babylon was the wealthiest of all the previous empires. Then after Babylon came the Medes and Persians that are represented by the chest of silver. Why did God use the emblem of silver? Because uh, one example may be that on the Medes and the Persians on their horses were harnesses made out of pure silver. It's very unique, but that may be one reason why God chose the color silver. Silver, And then there was brass. Why did God use the color of brass or the metal brass to represent the Grecian Empire? Many people believe it's because that Alexander the Great's army had a lot of brass, brass shields, for example, brass helmets in their army. In fact, there was a brass goat that was found one time that had one horn in its head, and that happens to represent the the uh, Grecian Empire, according to the prophet Daniel, and that goat was actually made 200 years after Daniel prophesied about the Grecian Empire. So see, God is very great in his patterns. When God reveals something, he does it in great detail. Then after, of course, the brass on the image was iron. Now, iron represents the Roman Empire. Is there a reason? Yes. Rome used more iron than any country before it or probably any country since. They had iron chariots. They had iron on their arrowheads. They had iron on their spear tips. Everything that they did as far as their military was concerned involved iron. And then the bottom of the image again, the feet and the toes were a mixture of iron and clay. Now, iron does represent the Roman Empire, so that shows us something there that the final empire of the world will have a combination of the old Roman Empire in it and clay. Now, according to the prophet Daniel, the clay represents men who would intermingle with people and become very popular with people. So you have a military kingdom at the end and yet a kingdom that is being, uh, as we say, motivated by masses, huge masses of people. And that's why on the image of Nebuchadnezzar that you had uh, feet and toes that were part iron and part clay. Now, there's another part to this that I want to share with you about this vision, and that is that in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel also sees these same world empires ruling, and he uses different animals to represent them. And let me show you this. There is a lion in Daniel chapter 7, verse 4, that represented Babylon. Is there a reason for that? In all of the old historical, archaeological excavations of old Babylon, where King Nebuchadnezzar ruled, there was a, uh, an emblem of a winged lion. We'll show you a picture of that here. And then in Daniel chapter 7, verse 5, after Babylon came the Medes and the Persians. The Persian Empire in Daniel chapter 7, verse 5, is compared to a bear in that passage. Is there a reason for that? Well, back in Daniel's day, some of the largest bears in the world were in the area of Persia. Perhaps that's the reason why God chose the bear to represent the Persian Empire. And then in Jan Daniel chapter 7 and verse 6, a leopard is used to represent the Grecians, or we now know Alexander the Great, which would come after the Medes and the Persians. Uh, is there a reason that a leopard was used? Well, a leopard is very swift, and if you remember the image, the hips of brass represented what empire? Greece. Who was the leader of Greece? Alexander the Great. What was Alexander the Great known for? His speed, his swiftness. From age 20 to age 33, in 13 years, Alexander the Great took over the entire known world. So it's very interesting that, that God used these animals as emblems of these empires because every animal represents something. The Grecian Empire, of course, was also um, represented by a goat with a single horn in the head. That's found in the prophecy of Daniel as well. And again, 200 years later, we, we find that there are, are um, archaeologists who have discovered these brass goats that have one horn in their head. So Daniel, by God's power and by God's Spirit in advance, is writing about these things and revealing them. So what I want to share with you is that in the book of Daniel, it gives you the four empires that will rule the world. They were Babylon, Medo-Persia, um, 
Greece, and then afterwards came Rome. And history proves that. History bears out that this was the order of the world empires in the Middle East and in, the part, in parts of Europe. Now, the part that we want to talk about, though, is the final empire. The final empire is compared to the feet and the toes of the image in Daniel chapter 2. And then later in the book of Daniel, you will read where he sees a great beast rising up out of the earth that has ten horns on its head. Now, if we come 700 years later to the book of Revelation, the book of Daniel was written about uh, 2,600 years ago. The book of Revelation was written about 1,900 years ago. So 700 years later, John, who is an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, he's on the Isle of Patmos in the Aegean Sea. He has a great vision of the end time. And in this vision, and he begins to write about some of the very things that Daniel saw, but John began to see in more detail. So let's talk about this for a moment. In Revelation chapter 17 and verse 10, this is the verse I read to you a moment ago. It says, There are seven kings. Five are fallen, one is, and the other's not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue for a short space. Then he says, The eighth is the beast that is not, or that was, that is not, but that will come, and he will go into perdition. Now, John in the book of Revelation, I want you to follow me very carefully because there's been a lot of questions that people have had about this. John in the book of Revelation talks about seven kings, but Daniel only talks about four. Now, what's the, what's the difference there? I mean, has John added some to this? Is there a contradiction here? No. Follow me very carefully. Daniel is in Babylon. He starts at Babylon, goes from Babylon to the Medes and Persians, to Greece, and to Rome, and those are the four main empires Daniel sees. John, on the other hand, starts at the very beginning of time and deals with world empires that have oppressed the nation of Israel, and they are Egypt, Syria, then Babylon, the Medes and Persians, Alexander the Great, and Rome. Now notice this. John says there have been seven kings. He said five are fallen. Who are the five that are fallen? Egypt, Syria, Babylon, the Medes and Persians, and Greece. Five of those empires had already passed. He said one of them is what existed in John's day. John wrote the book of Revelation around 96 A.D. or so. And uh, back in that day, the Roman Empire, Rome, Italy, the Roman Empire, the Roman Caesars, the emperors were ruling. So that is the kingdom which was in John's day. And he says, but there's one that's not yet come that will continue for a short space. That's the seventh world empire. That's what we're going to talk about a little bit today. That's the one that I believe is forming now and prophetically is forming now. But he says that one will only last for a short period of time. When that one is finished, he said there will come an eighth kingdom. This is the one we're going to be talking about in detail today, the eighth kingdom, which is the kingdom of what the early church taught and what the Bible talks about, the Antichrist kingdom, which will rule in complete authority on the earth for a period of uh, three and a half years. Daniel sees this in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. John sees this in Revelation chapter 13, Revelation chapter 11, verse 1, where this Antichrist will rule the last period of time in world history for 42 months or for three and a half years. Now, again, let's put it together. John sees seven world empires. He starts from Egypt, goes all the way to the very end of time where the Antichrist will eventually come over and become the eighth. Daniel sees four of them, and Daniel says out of the fourth, or out of the Roman Empire, will come this uh, final world empire. Now, when we put all of this together, this is what we begin to see. We begin to see that there's a seventh world empire now forming. We're going to talk about that in a moment. And then out of that seventh will come an eighth, and that's the Antichrist Empire. Now, Daniel describes it this way. Daniel talks about ten kings. He says these ten kings are last day kings. And he says when these ten kings come to power. After they come to power, a little horn, and the horns, you're going to hear me talk about horns in a moment. These horns represent uh, kings, they represent kingdoms, they represent authority. And so when we talk about these ten kings, out of these ten kings will come a little horn or a kingdom or a king that will take over the entire earth. Let's read this together because Daniel did talk about the ten kings. John in the book of Revelation talks about the same thing. Let's look at the scripture and compare scripture with scripture. In Daniel chapter 7 and verse 8, this is what the Bible said, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in the horn were eyes, like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great thing. The second scripture is Daniel chapter 7 and verse 20. And out of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that hath eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. Several verses later in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 24, the Bible says this. 
And, and the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. And another shall arise after them. Now notice in this verse, the ten kings have already come to power. This is the seventh empire that Daniel's talking about. And then a little horn rises, forming the eighth kingdom. Remember, this is what John is mentioning in Revelation 17. And this little horn will be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue or overpower, or as Daniel puts it, uproot three kings. All right, now let's compare Scripture with Scripture. If we go to the book of Daniel and we look at the Scriptures we've been reading in Daniel about these ten kings at the very end of time, and we go to Revelation chapter, 13 and we go to other places in Revelation to talk about the Antichrist which will rule, we find out that Daniel and John are both talking about the same person who comes at the very end of time. And let me give you the scriptures. First of all, both of the people that they mention in their prophecy are conquerors. Daniel 7, 20 through 24, Daniel 6, I'm sorry, Revelation 6 verses 1 and 2. Both of them are said to speak blasphemies, Daniel 7, 25, Revelation 13 and 5. Both of these men control ten kings, Daniel chapter 7, 20 through 25, Revelation 17, 12 through 14. Uh, both of them seek to change times and laws, Daniel 7, verse 25, Revelation 13, 1 through 7. Both are destroyed at the second coming of Christ. This is very important because you know they're talking about the same person here. Daniel 2, 44 through 45, Revelation chapter 19, read that entire chapter. It tells you the details of that. Both of these men continue to rule for a period of three and a half years or 42 months, Daniel 7, 25, uh, Revelation chapter 11, verses 2 and 3. Both of them are said by Daniel and John to control or subdue or uproot three kings. Daniel 7, 7 through 8, Revelation 17, 12 through 17. And I'll just add here that the early church fathers in the second and third century taught this. Daniel 11 teaches this, that the three nations the Antichrist will uproot are Egypt, Libya, and Ethiopia. Uh, some say that that area of Ethiopia would be also the area of Somalia. It's very important to, to hear that. All right. Both will control a temple in Jerusalem, Daniel 11, 45, Revelation chapter 11, verses 1 through 2. Both of them will, will fight Jesus at his second coming. I'm talking about the actual visible return of Jesus Christ with the saints. Daniel chapter 7, 20 through 25 speaks of that. Revelation chapter 19 again speaks of that. And both of them are destroyed at Christ's second coming and cast into hell, according to Daniel 2, verses 4 through 45. Read that entire chapter, actually. And Revelation chapter 19, 11 through 21. And I believe most of my scripture references are correct there. And you, you look those up and, and compare scripture with scripture. So let me, let me go over this again. Here's what they're, we're expecting in the future according to the Bible. Now, I know we're talking about symbols. We're talking about an image. We're talking about animals. We're talking about metal. We're talking about kings. We're talking about horns that Daniel saw in the beast. So let's just bring it down to common everyday language. All the world empires that, that the prophets of God have seen have already passed except Rome will be revived. There will be a revival in Europe of an empire. Now many people believe that this is the formation of the seventh kingdom that John saw in Revelation that will continue for a short period of time. This is called the one world government. You hear all the prophecy preachers and teachers talking about the one world government and this seventh kingdom that continues for a short space is the formation of this European common market. This um, It may involve what um, one man reported to me, which is called a pan-Arab common market that may also be involved with that. But it's a formation of a global government, a global economic system, and they're trying to also form a one world religion from this. Now, what will happen is this. How are we going to get ten kings from all of that? Well, the Bible plainly says that eventually it will come into ten kings. Who are the ten kings? Some people say the ten kings are the club of Rome, uh, or I'm sorry, where the club of Rome has divided up the world into ten different regions. The only problem with that is Canada, America, and South America were never a part of the Roman Empire. This all this prophecy deals with the Mediterranean Sea area, so I don't know that that's the total fulfillment of that. It may be a part of the fulfillment of the one world government part, but definitely not the ten kings that are going to rule because these ten kings have to rule in the area of Europe and the area of the Middle East, which is predominantly the Roman Empire territory. It's very clear from the prophecy, especially in Daniel. Some of them say it's the common market nation. The thing about that is it's going to be 13. There's going to be, some are suspecting, 15, 18, 19, 20 common market nations. And, of course, it can always go down to 10. But it appears there's going to be a great war in the Middle East, Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, a war with Russia, Gog and Magog, along with many of the uh, nations that surround Israel. And it's very possible that after this war will come the formation of the 10 and then this little horn. Now, remember, a horn in Daniel represents an empire or a kingdom and a king who's ruling that empire. He will come to power and he will form eventually 
the last uh, really three and a half years of, of time before Christ rules on the earth and reigns for a thousand years, uh, a millennium, he will form the eighth kingdom. So we want to talk about a little bit about, the, we've talked a little bit about the seventh kingdom, which are the feet. The, the ten toes are the important part because that's the eighth kingdom. That's the one the Antichrist comes out of. That's what we want to talk about for the next few moments. Now, one scripture in the book of Daniel chapter 11 says, This man will become strong with a small people, Daniel 11, 23. So let's talk about this man for a moment. Now, who are you talking about, Perry? Well, there is, according to the prophets of the Bible, and it's not just in the book of Daniel or just in the book of Revelation. It's in some of the other writings of the prophets of the Bible. It specifically teaches that there will come a man on the world scene who will be a man who will come in, in peace. He will sign a peace treaty with many people. There will be a time of great peace in the earth, great freedom apparently, and then there will be wars that will break out. The Bible tells you what will happen, and then this man will, will then come to Israel, take over Israel, take over Jerusalem, and persecute the Jewish people. He will also persecute a large number of people who believe in Jesus, who have accepted Christ during this time uh, of world history, and uh, he will eventually come to his end. That, this is the man we're going to talk about in a moment. Now let me say this, that the Bible does teach the Daniel, Revelation, the Apostle Paul, the four Gospels, Jesus talks about this, the Psalms of David prophesy this, the five books of Moses, uh, even though it's the law, there are certain prophetic scriptures there that talks about the very end of days and the very last times. Now, the very end of days are going to be very troublous times. There will be a lot of judgment of God on the earth. There will be fire. There will be wind. There will be floods. There will be tornadoes. There will be earthquakes, great earthquakes, major earthquakes, which will take place. All of this is recorded in the prophets of the Word of God. But at the same time, the, the Bible does tell us that there will be a, a man which will come that will try to unite all the world under his particular religion. A man that will come that will be a peaceful man at first, but will break the peace treaties and cause great trouble. And we've got to talk about this. Now, let's ask ourselves some questions. These are questions that people have asked for, for generations, really since these prophecies were given in the Bible. Who is this man? Is there any way of knowing who this man is? Secondly, uh, what religion will he be? And we'll talk about that in a moment. Why will the Jews be so afraid of him when he comes to power? And where does his power come from? Now, let's take a look at the world. Let's be very practical about this because many times when we preach prophecy, we, uh, we go to the Bible and we try to figure out, you know, how's it going to happen? Is it wrong for us to do that? Well, we should never try to set dates on anything. But at the same time, the Bible says that, uh, that the, the apostles of the New Testament searched the, time, or searched the scriptures to see what would be the manner of Christ appearing. So the apostles, I'm sorry I said the apostles, the prophets of the Bible were very, very interested in knowing when Jesus Christ would, would, would appear. They didn't know his name would be Jesus. They, they didn't know all the details about his life other than what the prophets had written, but they searched the scriptures diligently to see if they could find the manner of the time. Now, the Bible talks about certain signs of the times, signs which will take place. The Bible gives you many signs of the end time, many signs of the last days, many signs of Christ's coming, and many signs that will happen that will lead up to the appearance of this man and what will happen when this man comes to power. Now, to be very practical about it, look at the world situation. And we're, you know, there will be some uh, statistics that we're going to use here that are really rounded off. I'm not going to be totally exact on it as far as 1.1 billion or 1.1 point, you know, we're going to just round them off and try to give you a general um, idea of the world population. The world population is about 5 billion people. Out of the 5 billion people, there are approximately a billion or more that profess Christianity. There are approximately a billion or more who profess, let's say, the Islamic or uh, the Muslim religion. That's, that's across the world. There are about 1.1 billion who are other religious. That can be Hindu, that can be Buddhist, that can be Shinto, that can be Confucius, whatever religion people go under, other religions. There are about 1.5 billion heathen, and that is they don't believe in anything. They're just, they're either atheists or they're heathens. Or they don't believe in any God whatsoever. And of course, in this population, there's millions and millions of Jewish people that are both in Israel and are scattered out across the world that can fall in the category of Reformed Jew, that can be Orthodox Jew, and of course, there are a lot of Jews that in Israel that are atheists as well. Now, this is, I want you to listen to me very carefully with what I'm about to say. Every time that I have heard ministers preach on Bible prophecy, every time that I've heard them talk about the end time, the last days, the coming Antichrist, the last world kingdom, they seldom, if ever, talk about the Muslim religion. But yet there are at least a billion people on the face of the earth who are of the Muslim religion. 
And I, I've always asked myself when I sat there listening to these preachers uh, preach and teach, what about the Muslims? What part will they play in the end time? So what I began to do is I began to look at this, the prophecies and I began to study what does Islam expect in the end of days? What does Islam expect in the last days? What do they teach? And to be very honest with you, some of the information was a little bit difficult to get, although we did research five different books on the subject. We did talk to people inside of Israel. We talked to some people who were Muslim uh, here in, the, in, in, in America and also former Muslim, different backgrounds, different uh, people, both the Sunni and the Shiite Muslim. We'll talk about that in a moment and, and tell you about the two different groups that are in Islam. So before I, but before I share with you what I'm going to share, and I'll probably emphasize this once or twice throughout the taping, I have friends of mine, especially in the country of, of Israel and Jordan, who are Muslim. We get along very well. Uh, they're, they're very, the ones I know at least, are very family oriented. They do have this uh, zeal, incredible zeal for God because they pray five times a day and so many other things. So when I share with you what I'm going to share, I want to preface this by saying that I'm, I'm doing this out of my love for the Muslim people. I'm doing this out of my love for the Jewish people and for the Christian people. I'm, I'm sharing this message, and I mean this from the depths of my heart, out of my love and respect for them because I, my, my responsibility is to teach you what the Bible has to say about the end time, especially on this particular tape. So I want to preface what I'm going to say that we've tried to research this the best we can and try to give you the, the information that is true and is accurate and then compare that information with what the Bible has to say. So before we get into this, that's what I want to share with you. Now, let me say this to you very quickly, that if we, if we go around the area of the Mediterranean, if we go especially around Europe and the Middle East, here's what we discover. Western Europe, which includes Spain, England, Britain, France, etc., is predominantly Roman Catholic. Western Europe is predominantly Roman Catholic. Eastern Europe, which would include Bulgaria, Romania, it would include Yugoslavia, it would include Albania, it would include all of Poland, etc., that is predominantly, at least up till this point, Orthodox. Eastern Orthodox. If we go further over into Russia, we come into the Russian Empire, and Russia is predominantly, and I'm talking about the main part of Russia, is predominantly Russian Orthodox. The southern part of Russia, which includes five Islamic states, is predominantly Islamic. There are five uh, independent states in southern Russia that uh, border near the area of Iran, Afghanistan, etc., and they're predominantly Muslim. So what I'm saying is from Europe, from England, Britain, and Spain, all the way over into Russia, it's predominantly Christian. Now let me just say this because I, I want to say this at the very outset. Just because a person goes under the name Christian does not mean they're Christian. There are a lot of, there are millions of people in Europe, for example, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, and Russia, who say I'm Christian, but they never go to church, they never read their Bible, they never pray, but they, they say that as a tradition. It's important that you and I understand that, that just because someone says they're a Christian does not make them a Christian. You have to live the life, live holy, live pure, follow the words of the Bible, follow the words of Christ, repent of your sins in order for you to be a Christian. So I want to, I want to clarify that. So when I say Christian, I'm talking about Christian in name and tradition. All right, if we come to the Middle East, especially if you look on a map, the northern part of Africa, for example, Egypt, Libya, Ethiopia, Somalia, Algeria, Syria, Iran, Iraq, Jordan, all the way into Afghanistan, it is predominantly Muslim, predominantly Muslim. Now, the, the, if you look at a, a map again, and we're going to show you some maps here, you can see how that the Muslim religion is predominantly around the Mediterranean Sea area. It's predominantly around the area of the Mediterranean Sea. Now, when you, again, this is very important to understand this from the outset. When you come into Eastern and Western Europe, it's Christian. When you come into the other part, it's predominantly Muslim. Now, whoever this man is that's going to rule the world empire, Daniel 8 and 9 says, talking about uh, what we would say the kingdom of Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great's kingdom was divided up among his four generals when he died. They took the area of Egypt, Greece, Turkey, and Syria. And the Bible says, out of one of those areas, Daniel 8 and 9, came forth a little horn, this is the Antichrist, the last world leader, which racks great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the pleasant land. Now the south is the area of Egypt, Libya, and Ethiopia. The east is Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, and toward India. Alexander the Great's kingdom, by the way, went all the way into India. And then it says the pleasant land. The pleasant land here is without a doubt the, the nation of Israel. All right, this is very important. 
All the territory that I have named, Egypt, Libya, Ethiopia, Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, and India, is predominantly Muslim territory. Now, the West, and we are in the West, but the West does not really understand a lot about Islam. They don't understand a lot about its history, about its founders. So I want to take a little bit of time, and, and, but this is by no means a, uh, you know, a Bible school lesson or a historical lesson, I should say, in Islam, because it would take a long time, many hours of going into the details. But let me give you some of the details uh, on the Islamic religion. The, the messenger of Islam is the prophet Muhammad. Muhammad was born in the year 570 in Mecca. Mecca, by the way, is in the area of Saudi Arabia. He was from the Quraysh tribe and from a very, very poor family. His father died when he was born. His mother died when, she was, he was, when Muhammad was about six years of age, and he was raised by one of his uncles. He had a very um, close friend of his, a cousin by the name of Ali. They became friends, of course, through the years, and uh, Ali became one of Muhammad's followers in when he started the Islamic religion. And basically when Muhammad was young, it's, he traveled in, in many of the Arab caravans in that part of the world. Of course, the caravan back in that day was camels, and they would load the goods down, and they would trade and sell, etc. When Muhammad was a youth, as I said a moment ago, he traveled with the caravans in, into the area of Arabia and Syria. He married, when he was about 25 years of age, he married a very wealthy woman, and they ended up having six children. One of his daughters, Fatima, married Ali, and... Um, there was a relationship, of course, that developed there, and uh, we'll talk about that hopefully in a moment. When, when Muhammad became an adult or came into manhood, he would spend many, many days uh, in the hill country outside of Mecca, all around Arabia. He would be fasting, he would be meditating, and uh, from about 610 onward, he claimed a series of visions and was commanded to recite them in his mind. And the early messages that he received concerned God's judgment, uh, God's power, God's return to the earth, the final judgment. In fact, there was a real strong theme in Muhammad's time of, of the judgment of God on the earth and upon the nations. He began to preach these messages very strong when he was about 40 years of age. I think that was about the year 610. And uh, he began to claim that the angel Gabriel was bringing him these messages. And of course, he would begin to recite them. They were, they're in the form of poetry, a lot of it is. And then he began to preach what he said was the one true God and the Arabic name was Allah. Now, the Muslims, of course, claim that this is the same God that the Jews and the Christians worship. They claim that the, uh, the Jews call him uh, Jehovah. You know, we call him God or Lord God, and they use the Arabic term Allah. And, of course, there is a debate on that, and, and we're not here to try to prove or disprove anything in that area. We're just simply here to give this basic information to give you a better understanding of, of the Islamic religion. There was a lot of idol worship going on in Arabia, especially around the... Uh, there was a, a great big black stone that was in that area, and there was a lot of Arabs that would come in there and really many of them were pagans and they would worship different idol gods there so when Muhammad's message began to stir the elite up and they began to he began to encounter a lot of opposition then uh, he began to go forth to try to stop a lot of the idol worship and the paganism that was there and eventually in time he he took over that part of Mecca uh, a place called Medina and uh, had a had what we would call an Islamic revival or a religious revival back in his day uh, and again, I'm not meaning this to be a long discourse. I'm only giving you this information so that if you're not familiar with it, you'll know. The message of the Quran, I'm sorry, the message of Islam is called the Quran. This is their holy book. And the word Quran means recital or recitation. There's 114 chapters. The chapters are called surahs. And the verses are called ayat, and that word means a sign. Um, in Arabia, back in Muhammad's time, there was a lot of Christians and a lot of Jews living in that area. And of course, Muhammad did have some influence in that area field with Christians and Jews, a lot of contact with them earlier in his life. The Quran was compiled after Muhammad's death, so the Quran is written in Arabic today, and it is the holy book of the Islamic religion. Now, the Muslims teach and believe that there have been 104 sacred books. A hundred of those have been lost. Some of them were given to Adam and to Abraham and Noah, etc. They do believe in the, the five books of Moses, they believe in the Psalms, the four Gospels, and they believe that the Quran is the final revelation of God. Now, I, I want to add here so that there will be no mis misunderstanding. Every Muslim I've ever talked to teaches that the five books of Moses were altered and changed, that the four Gospels were altered and changed, and even the Psalms were altered and changed. So, therefore, they can't be trusted. Therefore, the Quran in the pure Arabic language is the only book that can be trusted. So, you know, even though that they're, they, they talk about the four Gospels or the Psalms or the books of Moses, you know, we would believe as Christians that they are inspired of God, that every word is inspired they would say that they have been corrupted or changed, so you need to understand that. The doctrine of the Quran, of the Quran, there are five pillars of Islam. They believe in one God, 
And the final judgment, they believe in prayer. They, they practice and pray five times a day facing Mecca, which is in Arabia. They believe in giving alms or charity. They also, there's also passages there that include on, uh, in freeing slaves. Uh, they believe in fasting. They fast during the month of Ramadan, which is their holy month. And this was a time of fasting given in memory of Muhammad receiving the Quran. They believe in the pilgrimage to Mecca. Every Muslim is required before they die to make the pilgrimage into Mecca. And then there is a sixth pillar that the Shiites have. And I say this because in all the books I've studied, they say that this is like the unwritten pillar, which is jihad, which is a holy war against the infidels or a holy war against the unbelievers. Now, they do have a strong belief in the end time and the last days. They believe there'll be three great trumpet blasts. The first will cause terror to come into the hearts of all people. At the second trumpet blast, all people will die. Forty years later, at the third trumpet blast, they will all be resurrected and have to stand in judgment. Now, it is interesting, and I will add this, that in the Quran, there is some teaching concerning Jesus. Uh, Surah, Surah 3, 36 and 37, and also 42 through 45, teach that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. Surah 5, 116 teaches that Jesus was a prophet, but he was not the Son of God. They do not believe, by the way, that, that God had a son at all or can have a son, and therefore they do not believe that Jesus was God's son. They, they believe that Jesus was obedient to God, but he was not divine, Surah 5, 49. And they do believe that Jesus will return at the end of the age, and we'll talk about that later. Now, let me say this very quickly. And this is important that, that you understand this at the very outset. The goal of Islam, and everyone I've talked to in the Middle East, everyone I've talked to who's been involved with Islam tells me the same thing. The goal of Islam is to eventually convert the world to the Islamic religion or the Muslim religion. Now, that may seem sound impossible to you, but let me share some things with you. Saudi Arabia gave the Muslims in America $50 million, $50 million to evangelize America recently. By the year 2000 to 2002, it's predicted that the Muslim population in America will be at 52%. If it's at 52%, it means that if they go out and vote, they can vote, vote in a Muslim president in the United States of America. In England, in England alone, just England, there have been over 300 churches that have been converted to Islamic mosques. There are 50 million Muslims each in these countries, Bangladesh, Turkey, India, Pakistan, and Russia. And the Muslims are now a majority in 37 countries of the world. Now, this is very important that you understand this. When you look at a map of the Middle East and you look at the Islamic influence around the Mediterranean area, there's one country that is standing in the way of Islam, and that is the country of Israel. Israel is the only non-Islamic country in that entire part of the world. Uh, the belief of Islam is man was created without faith or heresy, but from his creation he is destined to become a Muslim. Now, when you consider all of that, then we go and talk about why would the Muslims want to control Israel? Why would the Muslims want to control Jerusalem? And why would the Muslims be interested in trying to make all the religions of the world come under, the, the, under Islam? And not just come under Islam, but to become Islamic or to believe the, 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 the doctrine of the Quran. Why is this possible? Well, first of all, let me talk about Israel for a moment. Israel is a thorn in the flesh to the uh, Arab world and especially the Islamic world in the Middle East because it's the only non-Islamic nation in that part of the world. And we'll show you a map of this. For example, in Arab countries, Algeria is 99.1% Muslim, Egypt is 81.8%, Iraq is 95.8%, Jordan is 93% Muslim, Lebanon is 75% Muslim, Morocco is 99.4% Muslim, Saudi Arabia is 98.8% Muslim, uh, uh, Syria is 89.6% Muslim. In, in what some have termed the non-Arab non countries, Afghanistan is 99.3% Muslim, Bangladesh is 85.8%, India 11.6%, Indonesia 78.9%, Iran is 97%. 9%. Nigeria is 45%. Pakistan is 96.8%. Turkey is 99.2%. So there are 215 million people who identify themselves as Arabs, and a vast majority of them are Muslim. Muslim, And in 16 different nations, and we didn't count Kuwait, Oman, Qatar, uh, Bahrain, the countries of the Gulf states, etc. In, in, in 16 major nations, they are Muslim nations. And again, 37 countries now are predominantly Islamic or Muslim nations. So the reason that Israel is a thorn in the flesh is simply this. Every book I've read by someone who's writing from an Islamic perspective, they teach that the West helped to create the nation of Israel to help fulfill 
you know, our prophecies, prophecies of the Bible, at least that's what, what one writer said, and that the West has created Israel, that Israel has no right to be there, the Jews have no right to be in the nation of Israel because it needs to be an Arab country, a Palestinian country, and if you've kept up with the news, you know this is the big argument that the Palestinians need to be in the country of Israel. So from the Islamic standpoint of view in the Middle East, Israel is a thorn, the Jews have no right to be there, it needs to be an Arab or a Palestinian state, and it needs to be an Islamic state. That's why, that's why in the Arab world in the Middle East, they want the country of Israel. Now, why would they be interested in Jerusalem? Well, there are three major holy cities. Mecca is the first, and that's where um, the center of Islam is. Medina is the second, and that's in Saudi Arabia as well. And the third is the city of Jerusalem. Now, this is very important to understand this. At the very end of time, Jerusalem is going to become the center of all activity. It's going to become the center of all Bible prophecy. Notice this very carefully. In the book of Daniel chapter 9, Daniel gives the prophecy of the Antichrist, and he says, This prophecy is concerning Israel, thy people, and the holy city. The holy city is being Jerusalem. The Bible says that Jerusalem shall be trampled down for 42 months, Revelation 11, verse 1. The Bible said in Luke 21, Jerusalem shall be compassed with armies. The Bible says that Jerusalem would be a cup of trembling in the end time. The Bible says, these are all from the prophecies of the Bible, that uh, I will gather all nations against Jerusalem. So at the very end of time, Israel is in the prophecies, very strong, especially the book of Revelation and Daniel. And Jerusalem is also mentioned very, very much in the prophecies of Daniel and also the prophecies... Uh, of John in Revelation. All right. In 1948, Israel became a nation. The United Nations partitioned the land. The Arabs had part of it. In fact, a lot of it, all the way up to Arab East Jerusalem, was the country of Jordan. And the rest of it was, uh, the, the Arabs called it Palestine, but the Jews called it Israel. 1948, David Ben-Gurion announced it, and they called it the nation of Israel. Now, follow me very carefully here. This is very important you understand this. In 1967, during the Six-Day War, Jerusalem was reunited together. It had previously been a divided city. Uh, the west side of Jerusalem was Jewish. The east side of Jerusalem was Arab. You can see a map, and you see a, a kind of a yellow line drawn across it. That was the division. To the left on this map was Jewish. To the right on this map was the country of Jordan. Now, in the 1967 war, on June the 5th, the war began. And three days into the war, Jerusalem was reunited. It was taken out of the hands of the Jordanians, and it became under the sole control of the Israelis or the Jewish people. And now Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. Now, in, in, you can see the division that used to be there, and it's no longer there. The walls have been taken down, and now Jerusalem is the sole capital of Israel. Well, the problem that you're having is this. This is very important. The problem you have with Jerusalem is right in the heart of the old city, right in the area behind those old ancient walls that we love so well when we go visit there, is the Temple Mount. Now, historically, the Temple Mount was bought by King David uh, well over, let's see, it would be... 3,000 years ago from Ornan the Jebusite. Solomon built his temple there 50, uh, about 3,000 years ago. Babylonians destroyed the temple uh, 50, uh, 2,600 years ago. Herod came along over 2,000 years ago, rebuilt the Jewish temple. The Jewish temple was then destroyed by the Romans in the year 70, and there has not been a Jewish temple since. Now, the Temple Mount platform has changed hands. The Muslims took it, the, the the, uh, what I'm saying, the Byzantines took it, then the Muslims took it, and then the Crusaders came in, they were Christian, they took it, built a church there, and then the Turks came in and took it again. So presently, the Temple Mount platform, and this is where Herod's temple and Solomon's temple sat, the holiest site in the world to the Jewish religion is now under... Uh, Muslim control, and there are two mosques there. One mosque is called the El Aska Mosque, and the other, which is the more famous one, is called the Dome of the Rock, which is built over the dome. So there are two strong Muslim mosques there. Now, that's not the only issue. The issue is that Jerusalem is the third holiest place in the Islamic religion. So Mecca is controlled by the Muslims. They control everything there, the buildings and everything, all the government. Medina is controlled by the Muslims. That's in Saudi Arabia. That's the second holiest place. But the only place not controlled by Muslims, which is a holy place to the Islamic religion, is Jerusalem and the Temple Mount platform. So they, the, the Arab world would like to take over Israel because it's a thorn in the flesh there. So if they take over Israel, the very reason for it is to take over the Temple Mount platform so that the Jews or Christians or nobody else will have control of that area. It's very important that you understand this. Now, this is what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches. This is Revelation chapter, let's see, Revelation chapter uh, 11, verse 1 and 2. This is in... Uh, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. This is in uh, Matthew chapter 24. 
the Jews are going to build a temple and every source that you talk to that's Jewish will tell you they have to build it on the Temple Mount. They cannot build it anywhere else. Now, we know the Bible predicts, and I'm just going to give you some of this just very quickly, that there will be an abomination in the holy place during the last part of world history or during the end of the seven-year tribulation period, actually in the middle of the tribulation period. We know that 2 Thessalonians 2 says that this man that's going to rule the world will sit there like he's God in the temple. We know that John is told the measure of the temple of God, Revelation chapter 11. And... When are the Jews going to build a temple? Well, they've got a problem because the Muslims control the Temple Mount platform. How can they build it when the Muslims control the platform? Well, everybody you talk to inside of Israel that says they're going to build a temple have two beliefs about it. Number one, we will build it after the Messiah comes. That's one group. But there's another group that's gaining more momentum that says we have to build it, and after we build it, then the Jewish Messiah will come. And again, I want to say this. The only place they're going to build it is on the Temple Mount platform where there's a real problem here. And the problem has to do with Islamic law. Now, in Islamic law, follow me carefully, and this is Muslim law, if the Muslims build a mosque anywhere, that mosque can never be taken down. It can never be removed. It has to stay there forever. I mean forever and ever and ever. Now, the senior Muslim official said this about the Temple Mount. The mosque on the Temple Mount were built by the order of God our sovereignty is not subject to compromise. In other words, we're not giving up anything on the mount. This is what the senior official said there. All right, the question then arises, how in the world, prophetically, if the Bible's going to be fulfilled, how can the Jews build a temple on the Temple Mount platform with Muslim buildings there? And this is not a study on the temple, by the way, but we've got to bring this out to help you understand it. I believe it can happen this way, that in Ezekiel 38 and 39, when that great, great war takes place, and this is the war with Russia and all of the Arab allied armies coming against Israel, the Bible says that Israel will totally defeat her enemies. Now, Israel does have, and this is not anything new, they do have a nuclear... Uh, program. They have nuclear capabilities and, and strong nuclear weapons. They used to call their nuclear capability uh, Operation Goliath, and that meant the nation that attacks us will be attacked back. They have since changed it to Operation Samson. Samson means, what did Samson do? When he took on the enemies, he took them all out. And Israel is saying, if one nation in the future sends nuclear weapons our way, we will destroy not only that nation, but any nation connected with it who's involved in that war. Now, Ezekiel 38 and 39 says, Russia, and I don't have time to get into this, but Russia will be nuked by, in, uh, by nuclear weapons uh, in, in this great war of Ezekiel 38 and 39. Someone says, well, does it say nuclear there? No, but when you describe what happens, and we've had scholars that have studied this and uh, military men that have studied this, there will be a great war involving nuclear weapons in the future. Now, after this war, Israel will have defeated so many enemies that the, the surrounding nations will be forced into a peace, and at that point, Israel can demand what they want, and they can, they can probably get it. Now, let's show you some interesting points here while I talk about this. Daniel 9.27 says there will come a man in the future that will make a peace treaty. This is what the Bible says. I'm sorry, I said this is what the Bible says. This is a quote given by a Jewish rabbi 1,000 years ago. Listen to what he says. And the second king who will emerge from Ishmael shall conquer all the kingdoms and shall come to Jerusalem and prostrate himself before the God of Israel. He shall be a friend of Israel and help build up the temple. He shall make even Mount Moriah and call Israel to build up there the temple. In his day, Israel shall be saved, and the offspring of David, the Messiah, shall come forth. Now, this was written at a time when the Islamic religion was very strong, and this Jewish rabbi said, there will come, now listen carefully, there will come a person from Ishmael. Ishmael is the Arab side, who will come up to the Temple Mount platform, give us permission to build the temple, and worship God together. And this was written a thousand years ago. Now, something odd happened in 1967. During the Six-Day War of 1967, when the Israelis' military men went on the Temple Mount platform to where the Alaska Mosque and the Dome of the Rock was, one of the men that was over the Temple Mount platform, he was a Muslim man, he began to show all these Jewish soldiers around and said, look at this, look at this, look at this. And they said to him, why are you doing this? Why are you so friendly to us? And he said, because our Quran taught that there could come a day that you would come back here. So I found out that in the Quran under Night Journey 8, this is what it says. We sin against you, speaking of Israel, our servant, to discountenance you and to enter the temple as they entered the first time and to destroy utterly that utterly which they ascend to. Perchance your Lord will have mercy upon you, but if you shall return, we shall return. And uh, he, he mentioned that it said that there could be a possibility that one day the Jews would come back to the temple, and the man was just accepting it as that. Well, Moshe Dayan gave the keys to the Temple Mount back to 
the Islamic people and the Muslim people that were there. And now the Muslims control all of the Temple Mount platform and, of course, all the domes. Now, tourists can go up there, but Jews are not permitted to pray there. Um, in fact, there was a sign up a few years ago that said Jews were not permitted at all to go up there. There are some Jews I found out that do go up there secretly and pray. But by and large, Jews don't walk up there. One reason they don't is because they're afraid they're going to step on the Holy of Holies and kill themselves or God would strike them dead. There's a great fear of God on a lot of them. But uh, uh, religious Jews are not allowed to go up there. Tour guides go up there. Groups go up there. Uh, you can go in the mosque. You can go into the Alaska mosque. So I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about how in the world will a man be able how can anybody come to power that will be able to say, Jews, you can build on one part of the mount and the Muslims can worship on the other part of the mount? Well, let me, let me say this to you. Listen to me very carefully because we're about to get into something real heavy here. The Jews can never build a temple on the temple mount under any condition unless there is a major peace treaty signed with a major world leader in the Arab world who would permit him to do it and share the temple mount. Now, I know that you're probably looking at me saying, well, that's totally impossible. No, nowadays nothing's impossible. I never thought I'd see a peace treaty between, you know, the PLO and the Israelis in my lifetime, but there is one. But we have to understand, the Bible teaches this, and somehow in some way it's going to take place. Now, here we get, here we get to the very, very extreme heavy part of this. Uh, I found out, and this is nothing new, it's not a great revelation, but I did find out that there are actually two groups of Muslims in the Muslims world, Muslim world. There are the Sunnis, and then there are the Shiites. And there is a division among them. In fact, there's a great division. Now, when you talk to them, they all say, we are, we are Islamic, we all believe in the Holy Quran, and they, and they give you all the same thing. But yet, there is a division among them. The Sunnis are predominantly what we call today the fundamentalist group. Uh, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. I have to be careful here. Now, if I say something wrong, don't criticize me for it, because there's so much information I've got to get out. I've got to try to get this right. The... Um, the Shiite Muslim is the more radical fundamental group. The Sunni Muslim is the more modern. I, I don't want to really use the term modern. I guess you could say more open group. They're, they're more educated as far as in the universities and the colleges and etc. than perhaps the other group is. The Shiite group is 18% of the Muslim world approximately. That's an estimation. The Sunnis are over 80%. So the Shiite is the smaller group. Now, the Shiite group is the group that make up like the Hamas, the terrorist groups that you see in, uh, in Lebanon, blowing up the airplanes. Predominantly, you'll find that they are of the Shiite group. In fact, most terrorism that happens in the West, you can always trace it back to, uh, to uh, the, Iran the Iranian group. Now, I want to say this before I get into what I'm going to tell you, and that is this, that... Uh, in the West, there's a little bit of a misconception that all Muslims are terrorists, that you can't trust them. You better be careful. Look over your shoulder. They might shoot you or kill you with a gun or something like that. Most of the Sunni Muslims I have met, and those are the ones that predominantly are, are friends of ours that we know, uh, they, they want peace. They want to get along with people. They want to raise their family. They want to have a good life just like anybody else does. So please understand, I will say some things in a moment that I have to say to tie into the prophecy to help you to understand this, but I want you to get an idea of that part of the world. Now, the Bible says, listen carefully, that the Antichrist is going to be great in the east. East of Israel is Iran, Iraq, and Afghanistan, and India, that direction. What is odd is that the more radical Muslim, which is in Iran and Iraq, the majority of them are in, for example, 50% uh, of Iraq where Saddam Hussein is, is Shiite. Ninety-five percent of Iran is Shiite. So the, the predominant, more radical Muslims in the world are in that territory. Now here is where, oh, you talk about interesting. This is where the story gets very, very interesting. I found out, I didn't know this, I mean, I didn't know this for years. I've talked to prophecy preachers. They said, man, that's the first time I've ever heard that. I found out that it is an Islamic belief. Now we told you a moment ago that Islam says they're going to rule the world. They say, we're going to be the religion. We're going to rule the world. We're going to evangelize the world. Everybody's going to come under Islam. All right, well, we can take that and say, well, maybe so, maybe not. I mean, you know, that's just their idea. I found out, though, that in the Islamic world, they are looking for a man called the Mahdi. Now, some say Mahdi, uh, Mehdi. I'm going to pronounce it just the way that I pronounce it to, to make it simple for those who are watching. The Mahdi, or Mehdi, is going to be a man who's going to come in the last days at the end of time. They believe he's going to appear with Jesus. They believe he's going to bring the world completely and totally under the Islamic religion. 
And let me give you some, some facts about this. Both the Sunni and the Shiite Muslims believe in this uh, Mahdi, this future leader, this future man. And I'm going to show you. Now, here's my belief. I'm going to show you how I believe that the man that Daniel and John spoke about, this Antichrist that's going to rule in the very near future, this man may be the man that the Islamic people are expecting. And we're going to show you how this fits into Bible prophecy. And I know that's a heavy statement to say that. Let's, go, let's talk about this for a moment. The, the Shiite religion and the Sunnis both believe in this man called the Mahdi. And they also believe in what is called the Imams. Now these are um, men who are the infallible guide in religious matters to interpret their true meaning. And I'm getting this from the Word of Islam. This is a book written by John Williams. All right, in this, it mentions in the Shiite religion that there are 12 holy men. Uh, these are 12 martyrs, actually the 11 martyrs in Islam after the death of Muhammad. Um, the Imam, no, first one was the commander of the faithful Ali. And then it goes on and gives all their names. And it goes all, all the way here to the 11th, the 11th Imam. And then it comes to number 12. And the 12th, this is very interesting, it says the 12th uh, was a young man, Muhammad B. Hassan, who disappeared as a child in 874. Now, I had a friend of mine research some of this, and what they shared with me was that the Shiites believed that the 12th one, the grave was never found. They had found no evidence of him ever dying or anything like that. So they teach and believe that he is alive somewhere or that he has been taken to heaven and perhaps protected by God. And at the very end of time, at the very last days, this 12th one will come. When the 12th one comes, he will be called the Mahdi. He will appear with Jesus. Jesus, and he will bring the entire world under Islam. Now, here is a real clincher for you. According to a, a professor who is uh, with, uh, he is a Muslim, he is a Shiite Muslim, he said that the belief is that when the twelfth one appears, now again, they believe that this twelfth one never died, that he's disappeared somewhere, they don't know where he is, but, and I'm telling you, this right here, ladies and gentlemen, is, is mind-boggling to me. They teach that the twelfth one, when he comes, will appear on a white horse. Now, in a moment, what I want to do is I want to show you how all of this could be tying into the prophecies in the book of Revelation and in the book of Daniel. Now, again, I want you to keep this in mind. The Muslims believe that they're going to convert the world. And those who don't convert will have to pay the penalty, which means they will die. And the Mahdi will enforce Islamic law on the world, and Jesus will be praying behind him, and Jesus will uh, be a part of this, converting the world to Islam. Now, in the book of Revelation, chapter 13, what we want to show you is John describes two men coming to power. One is a political uh, military leader, and the other, whom John calls the false prophet, is a religious leader, and they work together. My theory is that the, the, the coming Mahdi the Antichrist, as the Bible calls him, will claim to be the Mahdi. He'll be accepted in the Islamic world. He'll make a peace treaty with Israel. There'll be peace. And then there will be a religious leader who will come as Jesus, who will uh, perform these false miracles and will deceive much of the world. And if, uh, you're, if you're a Christian or a non-Christian, you need to hear this. If you're uh, Islamic, you need to hear it because I don't know that you've heard teaching from the New Testament how this could all tie together and the warning that I need to give you from God's Word concerning this. So what we're going to do in a moment, we're going to go into to the study of the Antichrist. Many people believe the Antichrist is Jewish, and I'm going to show you why I do not believe. He may have a, a Jewish mother that would make him Jewish in the eyes of the Jews, but I'm going to show you why he will be a Gentile. Very important that we understand that the Antichrist is going to be a Gentile, uh, and we're going to get into that in a moment because all the different prophecy preachers that I've heard taught uh, talk about him being Jewish, but I think after we give you the evidence that we're going to give you in a few moments that you're going to uh, come with it. The, hopefully the same conclusion we have because this has been one of the most interesting studies I've ever done. And I've got pages and pages of pages of notes to get into. Don't know how we're going to get it all in. We're going to have to go through this very quickly. So we're going to take a quick break here for a moment and then we will be back with the rest of this teaching on the spirit of the beast from the abyss. Be back in just a moment. 